The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Eye on Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz along with my co-host, former Oshkosh Mayor and City Councilwoman Melanie Bleckel. You know, you can't pick up a newspaper, a magazine, or turn on the TV or radio these days, or even open your personal email without hearing something or reading something about prescription drugs. Whether it be how high the cost is, um, where you can get them for cheap, like from Canada or some other place. And it's, it's been making its way through the um, political debates, both presidential and even for some of the statewide races. And the cost of pharmaceutical drugs, what the industry is all about, that's our topic on this edition of Ayan Oshkosh. There is a film making its way to a theater near you soon, I'm sure. <laughs> it's called Side Effects, and we are very pleased to be joined this evening by two people associated with this film. Uh, the first person to my immediate right, or my immediate left, <laughs> my immediate right would be Melanie. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> They're my used immediate, to me. My immediate left is the writer and director, Kathleen Slattery Moscow. And next to her, we are joined by Dave Durbin, one of the lead actors from the film Side Effects. Thank you both very much <coughs> for being here. Thanks for having us. It's, it's a real pleasure. Um, well, to be sure, um, the pharmaceutical companies and the pharmaceutical industry is, is for certain a hot topic these days. Um, you know, you've driven up here from Madison, and the film that you put together mm -hmm. was, was actually shot, it was shot in, in Madison. and around Madison. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, you know, certainly we're going to talk about the film, and we've got a clip that you sure. folks were good enough to bring. H how did you come to make a film about the drug industry? Uh, I worked for the pharmaceutical industry as a sales rep for a decade, and during that time, <coughs> I had begun um, writing screenplays on, on a variety of topics and I kind of found through um, the things I was experiencing day in and day out that um, my best story was was happening right before my eyes. So I just started, I mean, there were moments where I felt like I was completely on candid camera. I mean, some, <laughs> some that were so comical and some that were so scary and I started just making <clears throat> some notes about things that were happening day in and day out and pretty soon my notebook was full and I knew I had a story. So I sat down and started writing the screenplay. And how long did it take you to write this? You know, ask any author of, of, of uh, any book or any screenplay how long it takes and that's a very hard question to, to answer. I started writing the script probably about three or four years ago and it's been a work in progress. I mean we were writing on the set still. I mean as we were filming, <laughs> you're rewriting even on sure. the set and when you find out which lines are working and which lines aren't working. But um, probably my rough draft, my first rough draft was done about three to four years ago and then it's just been constant tweaking and rewriting and it's, it doesn't feel like it's ever done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dave, what's your background? <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, whoa, whoa oh, yeah. what were we talking about? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I'm assuming that your only connection to the pharmaceutical industry is probably through this film. Correct? Exactly. I don't okay. know anything about Boy, the she pharmaceutical industry. Boy, she cleared you with that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Whoa, okay. Um, background. I'm, fr I'm from Wisconsin. Um, I'm a Midwest mud. I've lived in Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, um, and, and I've been in Wisconsin or Madison for about seven years, and I've done uh, quite a few plays, and I'm going to college, and um, I just happened to run into a friend of mine who was the casting director for the movie, or assistant casting director, and she said, uh, you know, I've been looking for you, there's this film, and, and uh, you know, I'm really proud of what it could be, and it could go somewhere, and it pays a little, and, you know, why don't you audition and, and check it out? And I, I was uh, busy with school and that kind of thing, and I remember thinking, you know, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> no, oh, all right. So I went with my best friend to audition and then I met Kathleen and her husband and they were 
videotaping everybody, and it, it was they were so nice and so easy to relate to and talk to, and it just, you know, she called a couple days later and said, you know, I'd like you to be in the movie, and I jumped on that wagon. All so. right. And the second he stepped on the stage, it was, I mean, I knew he was the one for the role, so, yeah. Well, I was playing the, it, the <laughs> yeah. not nice person, and I thought, what? What do you mean? And I'm, I've got that down. You may have to give pointers for people who are looking to get gigs. You like know? <laughs> I'm like, whoa, okay. Yeah, you may have to give pointers. Well, tell us about the film. What um, What is it about? You know, ultimately, the film is about a, a young woman who's kind of evaluating her life and her value system where she, and where she's at with things. And she works, the backdrop of the film, obviously, is the pharmaceutical industry. So she works for one of the large uh, pharmaceutical companies and every day realizes she's put into situations where she is selling out. And so the, the story behind the film is about this young woman kind of evaluating what she's selling herself for every day. And, um, and then, and through this process, we get to see and uncover the different things that happen within the industry, which I felt was really important for the general public to know as to how these drugs are being marketed and, and to maybe just um, hold up a mirror back to the un industry so they can maybe realize how this looks and how ridiculous some of it is. And so that's, you know, um, the, story, the story follows the young woman, but a lot of things are uh, come to light throughout the story. Based, it, her character is based on you, then, I'm assuming. Y yes, it Somewhat is a fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for the disclaimer to go. <laughs> <laughs> it is not a documentary. It is a fiction film. So, But, but it's, you know, I certainly, you know, spent quite a bit of time in the industry, and I had a lot of um, experiences, to, a lot of experience to pull from. Okay. And, Dave, what is your character uh, in the film? I'm the corporate executive, the person who is... Uh, the corporate the area core. district, yeah, exactly. yeah, the area district manager. The area district manager, yes. I am the um, <coughs> antagonist to the female protagonist. I am the uh, one who's ambitious and trying to get ahead, and you know, I sort of represent mm -hmm. the corporate world. Uh, there's another character uh, who's my boss in the film. Uh, we represent the the bad guys, the corporate world. We're sort of the the uh, negative. The epitome of corporate evil, so to speak. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bingo. See, now, I'm not getting that right now from you, Dave, <laughs> but you, no, I'm I sure know. in this I interview know. you'll work <laughs> that in. I'll yeah. try. I'll try. I have a question for you, Kathleen. What, you know, in reading um, the article that Doug Moe put out mm -hmm. uh, from the Cap Times mm -hmm. on you, uh, with regard to this film, mm -hmm. um, it, it talks about that this is, quote unquote, a work in of fiction, mm -hmm. you know, it's not sure. you. Right. And one of the things that you said in in one of your quotes was that you did not want to name the pharmaceutical company for which you worked. Right. Is that strictly for legal purposes that there could be legal e ramifications? You know, more so than that? anything, it was to make the point that this wasn't, um, over the course of 10 years, I worked for three different companies, and um, it wasn't about one particular company. So it, was, it was what I saw day in and day out in the industry amongst companies I worked for, amongst the peop uh, companies my, you know, um, other reps for other, you know, other reps, um, other, other companies that other reps work for. So the reason I really felt strongly about saying that wasn't to be secretive. It was just really to drive home the point that this this is what happens. This is what it's like um, in the life of a rep. And this is what we're told to do. And this is how we're told to say it. And so that was really important to me because it's not about pointing fingers at one particular company. Because it's not unique to the it's one not, company. It's not. And I saw that over and over again. And I think if you asked any rep from any company, if any rep would read the script, I think all of them would laugh and in, in, in some regards because they all could relate to everything that's going on because it's 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 not specific to one company and so that's why I put that. I You know, being a person who's worked in the medical field sure. at, at various levels sure. from grunt to, you know, up up the way and certainly not a, to an executive level but it takes a certain amount of courage, Kathleen, <laughs> to shine a very bright light in some pretty dark corners of yeah. the medical field. Yeah. Do you do you feel like it took <clears throat> some courage on your part? Because I certainly feel that way as one, yeah. you know, reading some of these yeah. things that you've done and, and yeah. watching what it's, you're trying to do. 
I guess I can say it's unnerving. Um, I sat on the script for a long time. I was hesitant in terms of when originally um, on the writing side when you write a script you then send it out to agents and production companies and you're supposed to just be able to freely send it out. And I was nervous at, you know, at that point of the game in terms of, I was trying to be cautious in terms of who I sent it to. Do I just put, how do I word my, my log line or my tag line about the script or about the film in a way that won't raise too many alarm bells but, but that alarm bells but will still intrigue interest. I felt like I was editing myself the entire throughout the entire process, and um, and then when I decided to make the the you know make the script into a film myself, I mean, it, it took it to a whole nother level. And so, I, I it is nerve wracking. Um, but what can I say? Is it somewhat liberating too to be able to do this on your own rather than going through these hoops on fire with? with the film industry, oh. the way you were going about it originally? It is so interesting that you bring that up because that to me um, has been the most amazing part of the process. I'm so glad that ultimately I, it happened that I went this route or chose to go this route because I really think I was the only one having written the script and lived it that could bring it to the screen in the way that I truly experienced. Um, Often what happens is if you sell the um, script to a studio, it's then rewritten another 10 to 15 times by other writers. Other, they bring in a different other writing t another writing team, mm -hmm. and they'll um, rewrite the script several times, and then that's only the start. Then the, a director who's not really doesn't know anything about really the content will try and take that new script and then bring it to the screen in, in his or her own vision. So I know that had it gone the normal route that it probably would have never ended up anything like how I had envisioned it and I'm so pleased with how it turned out because. Well what made you decide because I know you sure. initially said you did send it out. Yeah I did and I got an agent in, in LA and they it, basically the feedback was consistently from my agent and, and from um, some of the other folks is that we really think this needs to be more commercial. We this isn't mm -hmm. it's not commercial enough and so they had me my agent had me working with a professional rewriter and so I was tag teaming with with this person and when I saw the final product uh, you know we, we went through a rewrite process I was like I could not put my name on it. It was I mean, it was really bad. It was as bad as any TV movie of the week. I mean, not yeah. to, not to, I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of good TV movie of the weeks, but it was, it was so not what I had started out to be. It had taken away everything that was interesting about the script um, in terms of, um, in terms of the industry and the way it could be portrayed and the artistry. And um, so, in the end, but it all happens for a reason. And honestly, I think that happened for a reason because once that happened, I realized that really I was really the only one that could do this, and so. Just one of the questions I have for Dave, when when you, I, I understand that this is like the first film that you're actually going to be working on. Mm -hmm. You come in as a new actor and you're put on a project like this that has some very profound things that are going to come out of it. I mean, there are some very important things that could be coming out of this. Mm -hmm. If it's done well, if people grasp it, yep. if they understand. Right. From somebody who didn't work in the pharmaceutical field, you're reading through the script. Have you learned something from this? That's why I did it. <laughs> That's why I did it because of, um, I could tell, I mean, I, I haven't read a lot of film scripts. I've, I read a lot of plays, um, and that's completely different usually. But this, um, because if you just look in general at what's going on right now in the world, the majority of uh, films, namely documentaries, sort of have their cameras pointed at corporate America. And it's timely, it's right, I mean, you can kind of, mm -hmm. I think, feel it in the air, politically charged, artistically. Uh, sure. There's been a lot of, you know, what's going on in the world. And when I read this, I thought, oh, this is perfect. It's like a little planet alignment. And I, th th it also gave me um, a feeling of, I'm a huge films of the 70s uh, nut about that kind, because they were all very personal, um, projects that were exactly and they were all sort of uh, just lightly streamed with um, political overtones um, racial overtones I mean there was a it was a hotbed of, of expression and that's what this you know kind of gave me it gave me a memory of, of that kind of stuff and so I thought oh this is really interesting and cool and fun and even though you know it's a smaller part I wanted to be part of that this creation because I thought it would be special and there was a great positive energy you could feel on the set. In fact, even one of the actors who came from Chicago who played a, a smaller part 
who was a theater, hardcore theater purist, and I don't think had any <laughs> real appreciation for filmmaking or film acting, he noted that there was this great feeling that you could feel among people and on the set, that there was just something happening and something going on, and so And that you could palpable. be part of something really big here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, one of the one of the things that when when I listen to you two talk and I see the energy because I mean there's a lot of energy coming off the two of you about you know I I don't know if maybe it's what I'm picking up here is that I'm gonna make a difference I might be able to do something that might help someone else or you know it's it's bigger and you know it's bigger than right. you <clears throat> I get like this and I hope you don't take this sure. the wrong way but Maybe this is how Michael Moore felt when he started. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. When, when everything kind of started clicking? Because obviously, when, when you decided to first start doing this, sure. Kathleen, this isn't what, is this something that you said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a film screenwriter? And, and, you know, I mean, David went to school. Right. You know, and obviously this is where you want to go. But you started out in a, on a very different path. Right. How do you go from here to whoosh, over here? Yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> and change the world in your own way. I it's mean, called passion, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it is yeah. interesting because after you work and sell out to some extent for 10 years in an industry where you don't have that passion and you're just so, I was so hungry for it when I mm -hmm. was done. And, um, you know, so that, that I'm sure is part of it. But I did take a very predictable predictable path. I mean, I went to school for four years, got out in four years so I could get my nice, you know, eight to five job and went to work for corporate America for the next 10 years. And um, But it was during that time, you know, five or six years into it that I, you know, I just have, a, I do have a love of film. I love the, I love the way that film, um, how it can convey so, so many different things. And by then I'd, um, you know, I was, I was heavily involved with the industry. I was living here in the Midwest. It just wasn't feasible to pick up and go to LA and, you know, pursue this. But writing was one way that I could be involved in the industry. And um, I could do it from Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. And so I started writing screenplays. And then um, I didn't, I didn't, I never thought it would go to this. I mean, I never then thought, okay, and at one point I'll direct my own and we'll, you know, I, it just evolved. And you call your husband one day and say, hey, honey, guess what? <laughs> We're in the movies, <laughs> right? And he's going, oh, good, because I don't have enough headaches. <laughs> he, he was incredibly supportive. I, I was really nervous initially to tell him. I was kind of a closet writer for a, a long time, and I was really nervous to tell him because I know he thinks I take on a lot of things. And so, But once I told him, um, and once he started reading my material, and I think he really enjoyed what he was reading, he was, he's been really supportive and actually, um, you know, it, after the call came and I saw the rewrite that was done by the rewriter, and I was so discouraged, you know, just thinking, oh my gosh, is this what I'm, I'm gonna, am I, is this what I'm going to have to do to get this film made? Am I going to have to? I felt like again I was in that same spot of having to, you know, myself sell out, out, you mm -hmm. know, and um, and he actually said he he said, well, why don't you make it yourself? And it didn't. Um, it didn't, at first I was, it, it took me off guard for a moment and then like a day later I'm like, you know what, why, why wouldn't I make it myself? Why, it was just, it was just a, this breakthrough of why not? And, uh, and really I think that holds so much of us back. We just, we think of all the reasons we can't do something and all of a sudden it was like, why not? Let's do it and let's do it now. And I didn't, I didn't want to wait and I put together a portfolio and. Yeah. And you arranged the funding in a very short yeah, period of time. Yeah, two weeks. Two weeks I raised the funding. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, that's almost unheard of. We need of. you to stay around. <laughs> 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 we need not go back. But by the time uh, I'd come to that point, I mean, I had so, I mean, I just, I had every, I mean, I just knew exactly what I wanted to do then. I mean, it, it took going through all of this to get to that point. And so when I, as I approached the investors, I think they could see and feel that. I mean, there was not one ounce of hesitation or one ounce of, wondering if I would or, or could maybe do I'm this. I'm feeling like I should probably get out my wallet and be right in the chat myself, <laughs> I gotta tell you, Kathleen. Um, so, you know, let's let's talk about some of the um, some of the stories. Sure. Some of the things that as a pharmaceutical sure. rep you were 
you were commanded to say. Sure. You know, you were basically a robot for them, uh, as yeah. are most sales yeah. reps for the and pharmaceutical you know, that's industry. Kind of, well, no, that's I kind of the pharmaceutical <laughs> industry, but, you but know, maybe it's true. In, in general, that's the nature of sure. sales. I it mean, is. it is the nature of sales, so it's something that, you know, we do have to kind of keep in the back of our mind, but the problem when you apply it to pharmaceutical sales is that we're dealing with you know, life-changing, life-altering, possibly life-threatening drugs. So you, you're taking these very normal set of rules that you can apply to most sales forces and you're now applying it to a group that is going to possibly influence the way a physician writes his prescriptions. And I, I say that, I, I, I have all the respect in the world for physicians. I mean, I think they, and I think every year they're taking on more and more patients, they're becoming busier and busier, they're overworked, they're, I, I have a lot of respect for a physician but they just don't quite have the time it takes to keep up with all the changes that happen on a daily basis. And so oftentimes they will fall back to resorting to, okay, what did my rep say about this drug? They said I could do this, they said I could do this, this is the side effects. And a lot of times they'll make their prescribing decisions based on what the rep just came in and said because it was fresh, new information. They didn't have time to get through the journals. and. Uh, you know, that's the scary thing is that you take these very normal set of rules that you can apply to most sales forces and you put it onto, into a situation and onto people who, who can very negatively impact, you know, patient safety. So that's, that's where the difference lies. But, you know, it, it's, it's the same situation in terms of, um, you know, I'm a political science major. You know, oh, I, we have so much to well, talk about. <laughs> but my point is, I, you know, so when the physician would say, are you a science major? Oh, are you a science? Oh, yeah, I'm a science major. And I'd be thinking in my head, political science, that is. Like, you know, I mean, honestly, I was constantly, that was the one of the line. you know, not that physicians even asked all that often. Right. But when I would get that line, I, I almost every time I'd have to try not to crack a smile, and I'd be thinking, oh, my God, political science. I'm a political science major, and here I am talking about these major drugs, you know. And the industry tends, you know, you have to have a four-year degree, but, you know, we have music majors, drama. I was <laughs> just going to say, and you can have a four-year degree in veterinary and something or another, and what difference does that make? And, yeah, and that's just it. Um, it you know, so you'd get yourself into a situation where you're talking about this very serious drug and the if the physician asked you anything outside, you could speak very knowledgeably and sometimes even more knowledgeably than the physician about that specific item. Mm -hmm. um, because it's been so brainwashed in your head and pounded into your head, but if the physician would ask you anything outside of that, you know, that particular drug or that particular disease state, it's like you glaze over it. Like, it's like, sh they didn't I go over this in no, 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 no it, that's exactly. And it, yeah. it, was, it was always a frightening feeling as a rep to get to have that happen. And sometimes, you f I'm embarrassed to say, sometimes you fudged your way through it and you said something right. you didn't, you pulled right out of yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah um, and a little low yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly but um, you know and, and again some of this is hard for me to admit or, or to say but it, it, it happens and it's that's just not the situation that I, I think physicians should be in or the drug companies should be in or the patients who are just blindly accepting samples and getting getting random prescriptions from there I mean people need to know what's going on and that was really that was ultimately the goal, is to really kind of, I mean, there are a lot of comedic moments, you know, throughout the film, and then there's, there's obviously a lot of drama as well. And, and we'll talk more about sure. some of these, some of the more serious sure. things, but um, you did bring a clip. Now, mm -hmm. why don't you set this up for us? What, what are we going to sure. see on this clip? Okay, so. <laughs> So we j we're going to see our lead actress, Katherine Heigl. She uh, plays the role of Carly Hurt, who is the lead character in the film, and she is coming into her district meeting. And we often would have these district meetings, and then you'd also have regional meetings and national meetings, and they were the big rah-rah fests for the most part. And um, and Dave is is the district manager leading the charge at the um, you know at the head of the room and kind of leading the troops into war. And so we're going to see a little clip of Dave in action doing his doing what he did best so I'm gonna go to the bathroom I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> all right well why don't we take a look at that right now this is a, a clip from side effects we just received the latest Festral weeklies and as you can see we have really flattened off didn't we just have four weeks straight of record market share gains well as the saying goes um, what have you done for me lately Listen, people, the name of the game is growth, okay? Now, our competitors might pat themselves on the back for uh, past accomplishments, but not us. 
That's what makes us stand apart. Scott, where is uh, Dr. Schmidt at in terms of Festival prescriptions? About 2%. Why isn't he on board yet? He likes to wait at least a year before prescribing any new drugs. It's a safety issue. He also likes to reserve the quinolones for compromised patients. What kind of idiot would reserve the most effective drug on the market? What's his reason? Well, because last year, you know, when we didn't have our own quinolones to sell, we were calling him an idiot for using such a big gun when it wasn't absolutely necessary. Well, looks like you did your job a little too well last year. Have you uh, invited him out to corporate yet? No, but I was going to do that later in the week. Okay. Well, I want him flown out to corporate. Also, uh, make sure that you sign up for the upcoming webcast with Dr. Singh. I want you in his office twice a week for the next three. Got it? Yep, got it. Okay, just remember people, the company has a really big goal to hit, okay? We have until December to hit the mega double, double the profits, <laughs> double the growth. Let's keep our fingers crossed for a really bad respiratory season. Lots of pneumonia, lots of sinus infections. <laughs> Oh, oh, well, excellent. Thank Very you. good. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah, you had dark hair then. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely excess and greed, as one of the press releases that mm -hmm. I saw said. I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Well, yeah, and this whole double the profits, double the growth. I mean, it was, they'd set these, you know, every year it was something new, um, some big, and that was supposed to motivate us. I'm like, and we'd be sitting there like, yeah? And, but, and then, you know, the comment about um, that, that, that Dave makes um, towards the end about um, let's hope for a really bad respiratory season, lots of pneumonia, <laughs> lots of sinusitis, yeah. you know, and it's like, oh, I mean, this is the kind, you know, and it's, it's like true. when you would stop and take a step back and think about what was being said, it's like, is this really happening? Like, are we really saying this? Because on the one hand, you know, when you see the commercials for the pharmaceutical companies, there's always the benevolence of the pharmaceutical companies and, and, and just showing people living these happy lives. And, and then you'd you'd get feedback like this or this you know we'd be hoping that there'd be more depression like like a you know it'd be a dark winter so there's more depression or more yeah. whatever the whatever drug you were selling whatever the flavor of the day was you know um, so it was just interesting and just the comment too about um, when they were talking about the specific physician you know you know he's wondering why this physician isn't prescribing this drug and it's like well because last year we said he was an idiot because he was prescribing this type of drug you know it was all you know what I mean like it was it was just unreal so that's just that's a little bit more of um, you know some of the light-hearted stuff to just kind of show it, but also I, I think it drives home the point of you know this is how some of these decisions to how to market these drugs are made and this is how what's you know how they approach things you know so how much education when you were a drug rep did you actually get on these drugs were you required to read journals and I mean did they really do the drug 101 the flavor of the day this is what you have to know <laughs> kind of thing well when you were actively selling a drug um, meaning other than just like a reminder call where you're just really you know saying the drug name as you were leaving if you were actively selling the the training on the specific drug in that specific disease state was typically quite you know extensive I mean you had modules you know um, and you'd take exams that you had to pass and get certain, you know, a certain score on, um, and then there would be a little bit of continuing education after that, where a new article would come out, and they'd send out a quiz or something along those lines. But, it, it, you know, it was also um, focused. Like I said, if you were selling a drug for toenail fungus, I mean, you knew about toenail fungus like <laughs> nobody else. Like you could talk toenail fungus with the best of them. But talk about how that the, the side effect of that drug affects the cardio. You know, you you knew that it had something to do with some cardiovascular side effects or something along but those lines. But the toenail fungus but, was gone. The toenail fungus was gone, but you really couldn't speak to you know, what does that side effect mean? What is it doing to the heart that therefore causes this? I'm just pulling, I'm just, yeah. you know, I'm just making that you up. You didn't but know what the contraindications were going to be long term. Well, and we, you know, we knew what the package insert said, and we could recite the package insert. The package insert says that the contraindications are X, Y, and Z. Half the time we didn't understand what X, Y, or Z was or what that meant to the patient as a whole or, or you know, how the molecules, I know how the molecules would affect the toenail fungus, but, I, and then I knew that ultimately there could be some heart issues. Again, I'm probably going to be sued by some toenail fungus maker. <laughs> <laughs> There's no heart issues with the yeah. toenail fungus. But, um, strictly but fictional. The, the, the whole point of that is, though, um, I, I, I wouldn't understand how any of that related to one another. I mean, they did a pretty good job of, of telling us, you know, exactly what they wanted us to know about 
um, you know, the specific drug we were selling and, and the specific um, disease state. And obviously, it's sales, so they would always spin everything so that you really focused on the very positive things right. and you downplayed the negative. I remember, well, I can't go there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I have Do to it. edit myself a little bit here. But, um, you have to watch the movie. Yes. <laughs> but um, so anyway, it's just it just was all very interesting. and. Um, and it, 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 it was, the other thing that was pretty interesting is when you'd be in training, there would often be people from the medical department, the research side, that would come in and give a little talk. They'd give like the medical side. Because you got, when you were at training, you'd get the marketing spiel, you'd get this spiel, you know, you'd have like five different groups come in and one of them was medical. And you could always tell when the medical people were up there telling you about the drug. The medical people were just speaking black and white medical facts like medical people do. I mean, the, the sci they're scientists and they're up there telling us the facts. And you could see the, the, the managers cringing as the medical people were saying, they're like, don't tell them that because we don't want them to tell you know what I mean? yeah. like you could just you could tell them then they'd get back up and they'd kind of downplay what the medical person had just said you know yes that's an issue but and it, it, it'd always be spun back around in a more positive thing so it, it there always did seem to be this little bit of conflict between the science people the people that were just researching and and then the actual people who were in charge of selling you know there was always that feeling of tension what I'm sorry you want to go ahead Sure. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, <laughs> what, <laughs> wait, we're so delighted with each other. <laughs> with each other <laughs> we work well together. Um, so, what kinds of things? Because, as you said, it's sales. Right. It's sales. What kinds of things should the consumer be aware of? What kinds of questions should they be asking their physician if a new drug is being prescribed? Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, a lot of times when a new drug is out on the market, there's, I mean, obviously the, they have to go, the, any drug has to go through quite a lengthy process within the FDA. Um, but that said, when a new drug is, is comes out, there's not often a lot of practical experience with the drug. They, it's been studied in very controlled settings, but there's not a lot of practical experience. So um, I think it's, I, and I've learned that if someone's going to give me a new drug, I'm going to be asking lots of questions. Have you used this in other patients? How long have you been using it? And obviously, every, it's got to start somewhere. But you know, I, I think that's where people run into a lot of problems, because you get these really controlled studies and these controlled settings, and the drug does one thing in that environment. But then in real life, you get it out and you're, you know, prescribing it to mass audiences. And, um, you know, I would just be asking a lot of questions. I would be very cautious. I, obviously, you know, we all want there to be continued improvements in drug research and drug development, and we want the cures for diseases. And, and I don't want to take anything away from that because all of us will benefit, you know, from ongoing research and that sort of thing. But I think we all have to be somewhat cautious, and we all got to be asking a lot of questions. We shouldn't just accept that sample that the doctor gives us, or if he writes a prescription, just accept it. We need to be our own best advocate. We need to be asking questions. Um, and ask questions about that particular drug. What are the side effects? Tell the doctor. When the doctor asks you what other medications you're taking, make sure that you're, you know, really talking about what what is every other medication you're, you're taking. Um, you know, I would, and you know, I don't know, it's, I, I think the practical experience of using the drug really is something to ask a lot about. I mean, I don't know how much you can ask as a patient how much they're going to tell you in terms of, well, you know, did you get your information directly from the rep or how did you get your information because they might get pretty defensive. But I think, you know, if we keep raising the awareness, more and more physicians are going to stop. In, in question before they continue getting their You would think that, that they way. would do that anyway from a liability standpoint. Yeah. I mean, if you're just using some common sense sure. here, it, you raise some excellent points it, from like the consumer mm -hmm. beware posture. The difficulty from the consumer standpoint mm -hmm. is you're very right. Physicians are taking on more and more patients. The turnaround time sure. is tighter and tighter because it's all yeah. about revenue, baby. Absolutely. You know, and, I and the eight, that. And, yeah, and the large <laughs> yeah, Dave. healthcare organizations mandating you yes. know x amount of patients per day, and, and these patients are getting fifteen minute appointments. Yeah. you know, to try to delve into contraindications and you know family history and right, and not only that, with the insurance companies sure. changing, where you know last last year you had Doctor B, sure. this, this year because your insurance yeah. changed, you now have Doctor X right. that you've never met before, and in fifteen minutes, tick tick tick, because we're watching. Watching, sure. You explain everything that's gone on in 50 years of your life, every right. surgery, every pill, yeah. every, you know, mm -hmm. you know, 
when you had your child and what it looked Absolutely. like. Absolutely. And that's the danger in mm -hmm. this situation. Is You're right, and unfortunately, I mean, everything you bring up are valid points, and I, I wish there was an easy solution to that. I don't know that there necessarily is, but I think people do need to be aware that when they walk in and they're getting that prescription, you know, what is behind that prescription but and I the marketing. But I think it's that, I think the solution is doing what you've done. Sure. Is shining the light and, and making people not just aware, but maybe even a little angry yeah. that how dare you, you know, this is my life, maybe it's not all that sure. important to you, but right. it is to my family. Getting them a little angry, you know, mad as hell I'm not going to take it anymore and demanding more sure. of the health care agencies right. where revenue is not right. primary on their right. list, but that health care goes back to patient care again. Right. And, being, and the physicians go back to being patient advocates Absolutely. rather than the advocates for the HMOs and the hospitals that sure. own their practices. Sure. I, mean, I think if more people like yourself do these kinds mm -hmm. of things and, and kind of hi, this is what it really is, Sure, not not like the commercials. Right. Well, and that's true. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of doctors are doing, I think, and I don't want to slam doctors, but I think that pharmacists are sometimes, quite often, doing a better job of explaining about the drug sure. and how it's going to affect that patient and the interaction that it may have with other drugs than the physician. And, it's and that's right. frightening, I think, too. Yeah, I, I think what I've noticed over the past um, five to ten years is physicians and pharmacists actually collaborating a lot more. Physicians realizing that they need to actually depend on the pharmacists a little bit. And it actually, I, I'm starting to see, it seems like they're coming together a little bit more. And I think you raise a very valid point. Um, that, that at least there is that stopgap. The pharmacist is there and oftentimes the pharmacist, it's, it's mandated that they check and double check mm -hmm. and, and talk about what you can take this with and, and counsel the patients and that sort of thing. But I think it's been good for physicians um, to actually recognize that that um, need um, within the pharmacy community. Because I think before, I think the physician would just prescribe things and you know, the, whether the patient whether, whether the patient had, or had time to get information or, on it or not, who knows. But now I think there's a recognition from the physician community that pharmacies, pharmacists do serve a very important role here. And, and uh, you know, whether or not they're doing the job of the physician, I, I'm not sure. I do have a lot of respect for physicians. I think they are doing, working as, you know, putting in as many hours as they possibly can in many instances. But um, you know, there's got to be a better system, and maybe maybe more collaboration um, is the key. So, is well, is our system the same? It, do you have any experience with the Canadian system, healthcare via you know selling of of pharmaceuticals? Are they relatively comparable in the methods and the end result, or is it real different? Because you know we're hearing a lot that the drugs in Canada sure. are are far less expensive. Mm -hmm versus the United States, sure. but they're really the same drug. Can you shed right. any light on that? I probably am not a great resource to speak um, to that. I do know the pharmaceutical companies do have presen a presence in, in most major company or most major countries, and they do have sales forces and marketing teams, et cetera. And I think they, you know, they will bill whatever com country, whatever they can get away with. And, um, you know, they can bill more here because we've been willing to pay more here. And they've, but I, again, I'm not an expert on this topic and I don't want to, um, I, I don't understand. Want to lead I don't mean to put you. Yeah, in that's that okay. I, I just don't want to lead in, uh, astray. But I, that is one thing to t to keep in mind. Is um, I think they're very savvy about how it works in each country, and so they're, you know, that's how they, that's how they gauge their marketing tactics, and that's how they ca gauge their their pricing structures. It, it's individual. Well, here's a question, and, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you can answer this sure. either, but we'll give it a shot. Okay. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, you know, we hear about, now just today, I mean, we're taping sure. this on the 30th of September. Just today, yeah. there was a recall <clears throat> of Vioxx mm -hmm. saying that it can cause cardio problems. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think, in, in your opinion, Kathleen, is the reason that a drug can be on the market for a number of years, as Vioxx has? I mean, it's, a, it's still a relatively yeah. new dug, drug, but it's been out there for at least four or five sure. years that I'm aware of. Sure. They go through all these rigorous tests with, sure. with the FDA and approval processes and meeting certain standards, and yet then still, after they've been on the market for a number of years, 
all of a sudden, bingo, we're finding out that there's a problem and right. It, this just happened before we came over I know, here. I know. But I <laughs> thought that the report said that it was actually recalled. Okay. Now, well, and I, okay, well, yeah. all right. Um, I mean, how does this happen? How can you go through all these tests, sure. meet all these standards, and then find out something like this? Well, again, you know? oh, this I is mean, this is leading me down a path that. <laughs> but well, well, it mean, is abstract. Sure, as you can, sure. You know, again, you do all these very controlled tests right. with the drugs, with the FDA. You follow these processes, but then you, what actually happens is then the drug gets approved and it's being used in in real life situations amongst a wide variety of patient populations with a lot of different complicating factors. Some people are alcoholics and have liver issues. Some, you know, there's 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 right. all different kinds of things. It's a much broader market than what you typically find in these study groups. And so, you know, things start to happen in those types of situations. And when you when it's, once something's approved and the physician can write it, the physician can prescribe it. A lot of times things can be prescribed for off-label uses, maybe not for the things they were originally indicated for. Physicians have the ability to go above the, you know, recommended doses or doses. There's so there's lots of different things at work here um, that could lead to something like that happening. Happen, happening and at that point it's no longer a controlled study so these isolated incidences are happening you know across the United States different little case studies one doctor had this sort of happen one had this but you know the community you know it takes a while for all that communication to come together where, until we realize my gosh we've got a problem here you know and uh, so I mean in terms of when you ask how that can happen from that perspective that's that's one thing, you know. What does, what does a pharmaceutical company that's very interested in the bottom line, mm -hmm. making sure it's higher, sure. a product like Viox mm -hmm. gets pulled from your pharmaceutical regime to sure. sell? Mm -hmm. What kind of tom toms are going on? Oh my God! You it's, know, we've just lost a yeah. major cell, and we're selling a million dollars of this yeah. a year. What what kind of things reverberate through a through a pharmaceutical company like it that. Is, it is scary. I remember hearing stories when stuff was hitting the fan for various but for various companies throughout the last year, that the helicopter, corporate heli that if you were at the corporate headquarters, all you could hear were the corporate helicopters coming in and out all day long because the big works were, you know, you know, everybody's <laughs> pow, yeah, pow, yeah, coming in and out. And it is, <laughs> it is very frightening for the the people in the corporate office when something like this happens because um, obviously it's their bread and butter. They've got to report back to Wall Street. They've got all these pressures, for lack of a better word, um, that have nothing to do with patient safety often and have everything to do with the bottom line. And so as you're sitting there making the, like I, just in general, I'm not speaking to Viax, I know right. nothing about that situation, but in general, you know, um, they've got it oftentimes the people in marketing and sales have a job to do and that is to meet that bottom line and that is to impress the people on Wall Street and that's to sell more stock, that's to drive the, the price of the stocks up. and. Uh, you know, patient safety for whatever, because of that, oftentimes does take a back seat, in my opinion. Yeah. Because what you see very expensive advertising mm -hmm. campaigns. Sure. I, I, being in sales and marketing in a different field, not pharmaceuticals, sure. um, one of the things I, I've talked to physicians all the time, and there are physicians who are so incredibly frustrated with the pharmaceutical companies sure. because Nexium comes out, and I'm just using that as an example, disclaimer across the bottom, um, and somebody's coming to the doctor saying, I need the little purple pill. You know, right. They don't even know what it does right. because if you, look at the, if you look at the pharmaceutical ads, it's like the little purple pill will heal something. Sure. They're not exactly sure what it's going to heal. Sure. But I think it had something to do with the stomach, and I think I need it. Sure. And and it's I mean they're spending millions sure. because these are national campaigns. Sure. These are not cheap. Absolutely. So if you're looking at a singular product here, Kathleen, mm -hmm. and you're spending multiple millions sure. of dollars in a national campaign, one can only surmise the kind of money that is being made and sure. spent back and forth with these pharmaceutical companies. Sure. So I have to go back and I say, okay, pharmaceutical companies are getting the snot knocked out of sure. them right now by people who are really ticked off sure. for having to pay these kinds of dollars sure. for their drugs, okay? They, we're not taking them because we want right. to. We got to. Right. Um, but yet the pharmaceutical companies are spending gazillions of dollars. Now they're starting to come out with new commercials that said, 
all of our money is going to research and molecule splitting <laughs> takes me 15 years and I right. started this project when my kid was in diapers and I just finished when he's on rollerblades. Right. Is there a lot of money going to research? Because I was just watching sure. CNN and they were talking about how um, the pharmaceutical companies are outsourcing jobs mm -hmm. and outsourcing research. Right. Does this happen as well? Can well, you go there? Um, what I can say is that a lot of money is spent on research. I mean, that, that is a true statement. A okay. lot of money, it takes a lot of money to bring a drug to the market and get it through the FDA process. So, I mean, I really, there does have to be, and I tried to do this in the film a little bit, we do, there does need to be awareness of kind of both sides of the coin a little bit. It does take a lot of money. So, in my opinion, the way they look at it is, well, we're willing to take the gamble and invest that amount of money in this drug, bringing it to market and going through all the process of going through the FDA and everything, because if in the end I can make a boatload of money on one of these, it's worth the gamble. So it, it leads you to this conundrum that if you take away that reward at the end of the day, that possible reward, if we get a drug through the FDA, we get it to market and then it, we sell billions, if we take away that reward, are they still going to spend the money that's involved in researching the drugs? And I mean, it's something we probably have to think about when when we're looking at possible solutions. I mean, um, you know, I mean, it is definitely it is a very costly venture to bring a drug to market, and so it's just food for thought. You know, hmm. it's it's. It, I think it's something we have to think about, kind of both sides of the coin. And when we, you know, as in terms of the ads and the marketing that is going on. Um, it is frustrating because, like I said before, you know, you're hiring people who really aren't in a position education-wise to be doing the kinds of jobs they're doing. And I would like to see a lot more of that money going towards hiring pharmacists or RNs. And they, some of the companies do hire some pharmacists or RNs to, to rep the drugs or whatever. But I really think that they need to be putting more of that money towards people who are much more educated and being able to really speak about you know the drugs with physicians in a coherent way. Um, well, one of the problems now, though, is getting to the physicians because where the physicians' practices are owned by hospital sure. facilities, they're in a lockdown Absolutely. mode, and they don't want the reps to get in. We see too many reps. Absolutely. You're taking too much time away Absolutely. from patient care. Sure. So now you've got this whole other problem because. Yeah. Even if you could educate the physician with a in pharmacist. In more of an objective sort of way. Right. Exactly. You can't get to him. Right, right. He doesn't have the time to sure. talk to you because the the infrastructure around him Absolutely. Has, has said, listen, we want him to see 50 people today. Right. He's got 15 minute sure. appointments. He doesn't have time to be educated. By sure. You. And if it's an HMO and your drug, if you're selling a drug, if your drug's not mm -hmm. on their formulary, the then they don't want you talking to that physician about any other drug because you know it's not on their list. So it's it's all it's very interesting because there are. This is such a horror show. <laughs> <laughs> but there, it, there, it, it's not. I think the point of what we're bringing up here, it's not very black and white. I mean. Some things are black and white in terms right. of, you know, some of the thing, you know, some of the ways they handle marketing and some of the ethics involved, you know. But, you know, it, it boy, it's it's very complicated. The whole system is very complicated, and there is needs it like to be. Is this all over, or is this just unique to the United States? Is Europe like this? Does anybody know? I don't get around much. <laughs> Ashka, I know how Oshkosh is, but I just is wonder, Nina like yeah, this? <laughs> what's going on in Kalkana? No, um, I just wonder. It, yeah. Are other parts of the world sure. having these same kinds of issues? Because I'm telling you, from from American standpoints, we feel like we're the only ones that have a broken system. Right. Or certainly, we're being yeah. told that. Sure. Way. Do you do you have any insights on that? Or? Maybe this is the crack in the dam. Maybe if something like this is seen, then maybe other people, European countries and whatnot, will say, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's you know, maybe it's sort of like the on target that it needs." I haven't heard anything about this. I don't know of any other project, play, movie, documentary, television show that has looked at this to such an extent that I can think of. So maybe, you know, we will find out in the near future. If and maybe we can find a way to fix it. I mean, maybe well, this is the impetus the for the conversation. I mean, that's the point of all of this is that when you at least look at things, um, you know, you see things or are exposed to things that maybe you didn't know before, it, it's helpful because it maybe will lead us down to the path to a solution. So it's bringing up all these issues. Uh, you know, it's hard to get access to physicians. Um, the, the marketing campaigns, the TV campaigns that go on to the patients, could that money be spent elsewhere? I mean, these are all great things to talk about.
about. And the only way you're going to talk about is knowing what's going on. And so right. much of the stuff that I tried to show in the film is stuff that I don't think your everyday average person knew about. No. I mean, I think we all kind of probably went to our doctor's office once or twice where we saw maybe a reps, you know, repish looking person sitting there with a little <laughs> detail bag, or we've all been to the doctor and they've handed us maybe a sample of something. Mm. Or so we've had a little bit of experience, but it's like, who are these people sitting here all dressed, all quaffed, and you know, like, yeah. I mean, who are these people and what are they talking to my doctor with about? And what is their background? Yes, and they've got donuts. They've got donuts for the <laughs> office, and they're bringing in lunch. I mean, I will do anything <laughs> to get in. <laughs> <laughs> Need to shoo shine you, betcha. Uh, but you know, it's it's um yeah. I and and I really tried in the film, even though the film I think does shed a lot of light on a lot of things that I see wrong with the industry. I really did try to, throughout the course of various scenes, pr um, you know, provide a little bit of balance because again, without looking at the other side, you're never going to come to a solution. So throughout the course of there's a breakup scene between the lead character and and you know her leading man and and you know what you know they're they're kind of arguing about the industry and through the points and counterpoints we kind of we kind of you know are exposed to some of the other side of the story that we need to be thinking about like i said there's problems with the pharmaceutical industry and their marketing tactics but on the other side of the coin what are we going to do about this? If we don't allow them to make a profit on the drug, who's going to research it? If we over-regulate them, are they going to just stop researching? You know what I mean? So th these aren't easy. It's not black and white. There is no easy answer. But you know, exposing the situation can get us talking about it and maybe finding a solution. As a, as a former sales rep, and, and you sure. did it for a lot of years, sure. how do you personally feel about all the drug ads that are on TV? I mean, honest to God, the commercials yeah. for drugs yeah. probably I, I'm I just thought I needed Viagra for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I wasn't sure what we were talking about. What's the new one? The one, the female thing that just got approved the other day? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's but, Viagra's but, female yeah. counterpart. But, but they're taking up, I would say, a good 30% sure. of the commercial sure. market share yeah. on TV. And honest to God, if I see a Plavix commercial one more time, <laughs> sure. I'm going to spit up sure. because I'm seeing it so well, often. Well, obviously they're doing it because it's effective. It's driving sure. people into the office requesting drugs. As you said, mm -hmm. give me the little purple pill. You know, yeah. it, again, I... I I don't mean to, to you, you got to look at it from two ways though. I really think as consumers it's interesting because sometimes you're dealing with issues that maybe a consumer didn't even know was a problem that could be treated. I don't know, I'll pull anxiety out. You know, sure. Maybe someone has lived with anxiety their entire life and had no idea it was a treatable con condition and then you look at the TV and there's an ad about, you know, the little a, ball the, the, is there one? Is there, okay, okay, I don't yeah. even know what, but I, I guess my point is that that's education in a way. This person yeah. at least now knows oh my gosh, other people are experienced because they kind of describe what goes on, the racing thoughts, whatever. And all of a sudden, it's a light bulb goes off for that patient that, oh my gosh, this other people are experiencing this and there actually is something out there for this. So it's it's a catch-22 because on the one hand there is a little bit of education going on maybe with, with especially with maybe some of the mental health disorders where people didn't realize right. they were treatable or were medical conditions um, but for the most part so many of them are just about you know driving that name home over and over Plavix versus mm -hmm. the competition or if the more times they say Plavix throughout the commercial the more likely you're to go in and actually say the word. It's all more marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think there is a little good, like I said, that can come out of just patient education. But again, maybe that those funds could just be spent on just tip general patient education, maybe just a little spot on anxiety in general, not saying anything about a company, a drug, anything. And they do a little bit of that. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. Like I said, for the most part, I, I think way too much money is being spent. I think it is driving people in to ask for drugs that they don't need. Um, but I do see there, uh, there's a little bit of benefit going on, and maybe, again, with some specific conditions like mental health. Dave, will you ever walk into a drugstore, a pharmacy again, and view it the same way? No. <laughs> well, actually, it was funny because when you said, you know, how do I feel about being part of hopefully something larger and something that, you know, points its its uh, uh, camera at something rather topical. But I actually did have an encounter when I was 22 and I went to a doctor, a new doctor, and I had tonsillitis and I was given a sample of something that I just, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. And it actually um, screwed up my digestive system and uh, sort of threw me out of whack for 
a couple months, and you know, I lost like 18 pounds, and it was. Could you not give a me the name of that? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's not in the market anymore. They, they took it. They took sure, it off. Sure, anything that makes you lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, it was it was pretty scary because I was you know 21, 22, and who would have thought that you can have a bacterial infection from an antibiotic? And mm -hmm. it was crazy. It was it was absurd. And so, it was funny. 12 years later, when I got the script, and I thought. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's payback yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> that is. That yeah, it is. And now I get the big part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, yeah, sure, okay. <laughs> but actually, yeah, it does give you the drive to. You want to explore as much as you can, and and it is kind of scary too. I mean, I also have been in the position where I was asking too many questions to a doctor who walked out on me. Oh. And so, you yeah, know, you're talking about 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Same you know, he. No, I, I think I just made him mad. But I mean, I, I was being <laughs> as sheepish <laughs> as I could yeah. with with asking questions, and you know, he sort of stormed out. And I, I filed a complaint, and I talked with one of the nurses, and she said that it was a common thing that people have been complaining about the treatment from doctors, mm -hmm. in walk-in clinics, and and all that kind of thing. So, it's it's pretty scary but it does give you that you know you don't want to be a victim you want to be proactive and you want to take charge and you want to you know <laughs> I'm not taking this unless well, you exactly. tell me and isn't that funny that he should get mad at you and walk out because this is the day after all we keep hearing about consumer driven health care consumer driven health care consumer driven health care mm -hmm. they want patients as consumers to take a more proactive active role mm -hmm. and be proactive and ask a lot of questions and then when Dave Durbin comes along and asks a lot of questions they he asks out. one <laughs> question too many and this guy's bolting for the door yeah. to the next exam room. his name is Dr. No, <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen goes <laughs> work of fiction <laughs> Can you tell my attorney called right <laughs> before I walk in the door? No, this is what you can't say. No. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm we've not <laughs> led you down any bad no, path I know. here, so it's, it's been a good hour. <laughs> um, but it, and we're just about out of time. But real quickly, and Mel kind of touched on this earlier. Did you run into any kind of roadblocks at all? Um, in, in making this with the drug companies, rather? I, Were they um, trying to stifle this a little? I did not, but I can't tell you what, I mean, I went to a lot of lengths to keep it under wraps. So I was really concerned that even as we were approaching locations about where we were shooting, I was always, and people would say, well, what's the film about? And I would say, oh, it's a romantic dramedy about a young woman, you know, <laughs> selling her, what she's evaluating what she sells herself for. I, I never would say, you know, this is a film with, you know, about the pharmaceutical industry or the backdrop is, you know, because I just, I didn't want until we were done, until we had it in the can, um, where there wasn't any, you know, um, I, di I didn't want until we were done um, to really have it be public, public knowledge. Very so. smart. And it was shot all completely in and around Madison. In and around Madison, yeah. Where can people see this? Well, um, we we, <laughs> <laughs> we have just that. begun. <laughs> we literally just um, finished the film um, within the past week, and we've sent it off to have the sound mastered and all that good stuff. And we um, have submitted to the film festivals uh, circuit. So um, we'll see which film festivals we get into. That will be a starting point. And then from there, um, oftentimes films will get picked up um, by distributor through the film festivals or you market to them directly okay. at that point they take it to the theater so okay all right hopefully Very good. soon well the film is called side effects we'd like to thank kathleen slattery moscow and dave durbin for being here thank, thank you thank you. Very much. thank you best of luck with thank the you film. very much it was very enjoyable and thank you all for joining us we'll see you next time until then take good care and keep your eye on us we've got our eye on oshkosh Oh,